Werewolves, in my Bible, it's more likely than you think. Well, I mean, kind of. At least, that's one way of looking at it. In this video, we're going to talk about King Nebuchadnezzar's animal transformation in Daniel 4. I'm Katav, and this is Firmenutics. Daniel is a book in the Hebrew Bible that's composed of two main parts. Chapters 1 through 6 consist of court tales, mostly stories about a Jew named Daniel who is taken into exile in Babylonia and has to figure out how to survive under a ruler who is arrogant, capricious, and completely ignorant. I wonder what that's like. Chapters 7 through 12 consist of apocalyptic material, in which Daniel sees visions of symbolic animals that represent the Hellenistic empires in the 3rd and 2nd centuries BCE. And if you read the book of Daniel in the Greek, there's even more material, including a dragon. So that's exciting. Chapter 4 of Daniel is one of the court tales. In this story, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has a strange dream and the character Daniel interprets the dream for him. Basically, Nebuchadnezzar is the mighty ruler of a huge empire, and because he's getting a little too haughty about all this empire stuff, the god of the Jews decides to take him down a notch. So Daniel tells him the dream he had is a prediction that he will be turned into an animal for a period of time. And that's exactly what happens in the story. A year later, Nebuchadnezzar looks out at his empire and basically says, look how cool I am. And God turns him into an animal. According to the usual telling of the story, after some time as an animal, Nebuchadnezzar learns some humility and God restores him to his human self. Damn it, this is the ending of Beauty and the Beast all over again. Why can't he just stay a beast? That's the basic story of Daniel 4, and there's a lot to explore here, but I want to look at a couple things in particular. First, what does it mean to say Nebuchadnezzar is turned into an animal? And second, what is the lesson this story is trying to communicate? Let's begin with the first question. Nebuchadnezzar becomes an animal, but what does that mean? Which animal? Well, the text doesn't actually identify him as one specific species, but we can get some clues. With regard to his behavior, we're told that in his animal form, he eats grass like oxen. With regard to his appearance, the Aramaic says he has a bird's feathers and a bird's talons, and the ancient Greek versions add a lion to the mix, either giving him a lion's mane and bird claws or the opposite a bird's feathers, and a lion's claws. Either way, considering his new vegetarian diet and his more carnivorous bodily changes, it's clear this is not a single creature, but rather something more chimerical. But this has not stopped readers from making suggestions about Nebuchadnezzar's animalization. Some commentators in the 1700s and 1800s proposed that he has various medical conditions that could be categorized under lycanthropy, which is to say, maybe he's something like a werewolf. His animal transformation isn't connected to the phases of the moon, and silver bullets don't play any role in the story, but he does appear to believe himself to be an animal, a symptom of clinical lycanthropy, and he has excessive hair growth, a symptom of hypertrichosis, also popularly associated with werewolfery. But, as I've mentioned, he doesn't eat people, he eats grass, so he would be a pretty odd werewolf. And the text doesn't characterize him with any lupine features anyway. So because the werewolf connection doesn't fit that well, some readers have suggested that he suffers not from lycanthropy, but rather something like boanthropy. That is, he's not a wolf man, but a cow man. But again, even though he eats grass, he also has talons and a mantle of fur or feathers, so he's not entirely a cow either. Most scholars today have given up trying to decide specifically what Nebuchadnezzar becomes here. The story is not likely to have anything more than the slightest kernel of historical truth to it, so any precise medical diagnosis is beyond the purview of a historian. So we can't say for sure what Nebuchadnezzar transforms into, but if you ask me, the idea of a biblical werewolf is still pretty fun. And now for my second question. What does this story mean? 
Well, the question of what the author's intention is can be pretty complicated. The author isn't alive anymore to tell us what they meant in telling the story, so the best we can do is educated guesswork. And in any case, the author's intention isn't the final meaning of any text. Texts continue to mean new things for each new generation of readers. But the typical interpretation of this story's intention is the one I mentioned at the beginning. Nebuchadnezzar is arrogant, so he is humbled and becomes subhuman in order to learn humility. And once he's learned his lesson, he regains his humanity. Almost every biblical scholar today accepts some version of this interpretation, but I have a couple problems with it. First of all, the terminology that many scholars use is pretty ableist. This story is often called something like the madness of King Nebuchadnezzar, which presumes an association of having mental health issues with being subhuman. This seems pretty harmful to me. In addition, the guiding assumption behind most scholars' reading is that being an animal is indeed subhuman. That is, they read Nebuchadnezzar's loss of humanity as a punishment that places him in a lower state. This too seems harmful to me, as I don't think it's necessary to assume that non-human animals are somehow less than humans. Let me offer my own reading. As Nebuchadnezzar recounts his dream toward the beginning of the story, he says a heavenly messenger told him his mind would no longer be that of a human, but rather he would receive an animal mind. The scholars who favor the madness reading of the story talk about Nebuchadnezzar as if he has lost all rationality, as if he's lost all semblance of a mind. But the text is specific about his mental state. He won't have a human mind for the time being, but he will have an animal mind. That's significant. And why does he receive an animal mind? Is it to punish him or humiliate him? Well, there's probably some amount of humbling going on here, but that's not the only reason. As Daniel interprets the dream for him, he tells Nebuchadnezzar the purpose behind all this. He will be an animal until he has learned that the Jewish God is sovereign. So his animal transformation is not meant purely as humiliation. Rather, it is meant to be a learning experience. God turns him into an animal in order to educate him. Now, the Hebrew Bible is not overwhelmingly positive when it comes to animal intelligence, but there is a strain of thought that runs throughout it that sees animals as having some knowledge, even a special knowledge of the divine. The snake in Genesis 3 is kind of the first theologian in the Bible. And in Numbers 22, Balaam's donkey can see a heavenly being that Balaam himself, a human, can't see. Wisdom literature in the Hebrew Bible also has many references to animals being intelligent in general or being specifically perceptive in divine matters. With this strand of thinking in mind, I suggest that it's only by becoming an animal that Nebuchadnezzar will learn what he's supposed to about God. Maybe his time as a beast is the only thing that can cure his theological ignorance. If we read the story in this way, his animalization isn't about making him subhuman. It's about giving him necessary knowledge, knowledge that he wouldn't have otherwise. So what can we learn from this? Well, a traditional confessional reading might say that we should be humble and exhibit appropriate reverence toward God, lest God punish us. I think, however, that if we move beyond this pious reading, this story can incite us to think deeply about humanity and animality. On the one paw, as I've mentioned, mental health is not at issue in this story, and scholars should not dehumanize neuroatypical people in their interpretations. On the other paw, if we view animalization not as humiliation, but rather as education, this could open up a whole world of fascinating questions about animals. Nebuchadnezzar comes to know the Jewish God by being an animal, so we might ask, what do other animals know that we don't know? What does the world look like from another animal's point of view? What insight does your dog or cat have that you could learn from? What do the squirrels and birds in the tree outside your window know that you don't? If werewolves were real, what special knowledge would they have in becoming an animal? And we might even ask, when furries take on an animal persona or put on a fursuit, 
Does this give us any special insight about humanity and animality that the general population doesn't have? I don't have answers to all of this, but these questions do open up some real fun possibilities for discussion about non-human animals and about ourselves. Nebuchadnezzar might not technically be a werewolf, but he's the closest thing to it in the Bible. And even if he's not, Daniel 4 is an interesting story in all sorts of ways. I'm curious to know, what are your thoughts? Does my interpretation work for you? Can we learn something from animals? Or do you favor a different interpretation of the king's animal transformation? What do you think is Nebuchadnezzar's persona? Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe. You get it? You get it? Alright, I think I got it. Alright, that's a wrap.